complexity science is a new approach or method to science that has arisen over the past few decades to present an alternative paradigm to our traditional methods of scientific inquiry. To give you context, let's start by talking a bit about our traditional approach to scientific research. We can loosely define science as a type of inquiry into the world around us, as opposed to other areas such as art or religion that are based upon aesthetics or revelation. The scientific method of inquiry claims to be based upon empirical data, otherwise known as facts. The beginning of the modern era, approximately 500 years ago, saw the development of a systematic and coherent framework for conducting this scientific inquiry. This framework became most clearly formulated within the work of Sir Isaac Newton, and thus Newtonian physics became an example or paradigm of how modern science should be conducted. The Newtonian paradigm is a whole way of seeing the world that describes phenomena as the product of linear cause and effect interactions between isolated objects that are determined by mathematical laws. This view of things results in a very mechanical vision of the world, sometimes called the clockwork universe. This paradigm in turn gave rise to a new method of inquiry called reductionism. Reductionism is the process of breaking down complex phenomena into simple components that can be modelled using linear equations. By then reassembling these individual components, we can understand the whole system as simply the sum of its individual parts. Having been phenomenally successful within physics, this framework for modern science has gone on over the centuries to be applied to almost all areas of inquiry from biology to engineering and business management, placing it at the heart of our modern understanding of the world. It is only during the 20th century that this approach to science began to be called into question as the revolution of quantum physics and relativity showed some of its basic assumptions about time and space and causality to be in fact flawed. Whilst later in the century, chaos theory began to open up a whole new world of non-linear systems. Outside of science, the world had also become very different from the one of Newton, as globalization, information technology and sustainability present us with new challenges of understanding, designing and managing systems that are highly interconnected, interdependent and non-linear, what we now call complex systems. This is where complexity science comes in to provide us with an alternative scientific method better suited to researching these complex systems, supported by a paradigm that sees the world as a set of interconnected elements whose interaction give rise to the patterns that we observe in the world around us. As opposed to traditional science that tries to eliminate complexity by studying the individual components of systems in an isolated environment, Complexity science places a greater emphasis upon open systems, that is, understanding systems within the complex relations that give them context. Whereas traditional reductionist science primarily uses linear mathematical models and equations as its theoretical foundations, complexity science uses the concepts of complexity theory such as self-organization, network theory, adaptation and evolution. This new theoretical framework is combined with new methods such as agent-based modeling. As opposed to describing the phenomena we observe in terms of laws of nature encoded in equations, agent-based modeling takes a more bottom-up approach, describing them as the emergent phenomena of local-level interactions of agents that are governed by simple rules. Complexity science studies the complex systems in our world that have previously fallen between the gaps of modern science such as financial networks, cities, ecosystems and social networks. Studying these large, complex systems typically requires significant amounts of data. Thus, what the microscope, telescope and laboratory were to modern science, computation and data are to complexity science, which relies heavily on computer simulations and analysis of the mass of rich and diverse data that information technology has provided us with. In a time when science has become highly specialised and focused upon extreme scales, complexity science is providing a fresh perspective for refocusing on the everyday world in front of us and helping us to bridge the traditional divides between sciences. In so doing, it is helping us expand our scientific body of knowledge to make it richer, 
more inclusive, and proving particularly relevant as a new method for providing the knowledge needed to tackle some of the core challenges we face at the turn of the 21st century. Every day, when we switch on the lights, connect to the internet or commute to work, we are forming part of what are called complex systems. But to understand complex systems, we need to talk a bit about systems in general first. A system is a type of model we use to understand the world around us. In its essence, it is a group of parts called elements that function together to form a whole that is called the system. This very simple and abstract model can be used to describe a wide variety of things. Now, let's add complexity to this. Although there is no formal definition for it, we can understand complexity as a parameter. That is to say that it is a measurement of something. Firstly, it is a measurement of the number of elements within our system. This is intuitive to us. A society is more complex than a small group of friends as it has many more subsystems and elements interacting on various scales. Secondly, it is a measurement of the degree of connectivity within a system. When we have a low level of connections between elements within a system, we can describe it by simply describing the properties of the individual elements. But as we increase the connectivity, it is increasingly the relations between the elements that come to define the system. Thus, complex systems are typically modeled as networks that can capture and quantify this information about the relationships between the elements. Thirdly, adaptation. When elements become capable of adapting, their behavior over time can become increasingly complex. Thus, complex adaptive systems are often best modeled as the product of evolutionary dynamics that have shaped them over time, as opposed to the static analysis of their individual parts. The capacity of adaptation also means that elements can self-organize, limiting the need for centralized control and allowing for the emergence of organization from the bottom up, as individual elements can interact and synchronize to form patterns. Fourthly, complexity is also a measure of the degree of diversity between elements within a system. Again, the greater the diversity between the parts, the more complex and abstract our models will have to be to capture the underlying common features. So now we have an idea of what systems and complexity are. Let's put them together, starting with a system with a low level of complexity. An example of this might be a set of, say, five billiard balls on a table. There are quite few of them, they are all the same, they are all separate from each other, and they are incapable of adapting. If we input some energy into this system by, say, pushing one of the balls, the outcome to this event is directly proportional to the input and is predetermined by it. We can repeat the same action a million times and we will get the exact same results. We call this type of system a deterministic or linear system because we can draw a direct line between the cause and effect, that is, input and output to the system. Because linear systems are relatively easy to model and control, much of our modern science, engineering and management practices rest upon this type of linear understanding to the world. Ok, so now let's think about what happens when we turn up the complexity. Take an example of an ecosystem. Ecosystems typically have many elements or creatures. These creatures are diverse, interconnected and capable of adaptation. Now let's add some input to this system. Say we build an industrial zone right next to it, emitting pollution. Given the ecosystem's capacity for adaptation, the result, or output to this, may well be negligible to us initially. So we continue expanding our industrial zone. At some point, the stress from this additional input will reach a critical tipping point, with some small additional input being able to propagate through the system, creating a phase transition as our ecosystem collapses. Thus, complex systems can exhibit both extraordinary robustness and extraordinary fragility, where some small event can have a large systemic effect, known popularly as the butterfly effect. The point to take away from this illustration is that complex systems are what is called non-linear, meaning unlike our original example with the billiard ball, cause and effect are no longer directly related. It is due to the fact that complex systems are non-linear and largely defined by their connections that make them unamenable to our traditional scientific methods of analysis that often rely upon linear models and a component-based description of the world. 
Thus, the area of complex systems has arisen over the past few decades as an alternative paradigm within science and engineering to deal with these non-linear systems by placing a greater emphasis upon the connections and relations between the elements. It currently represents a broad and diverse set of methods, primarily among which is the use of computational modeling, where elements are given a simple set of rules that govern their behavior and are left to interact and evolve over time to see if relevant patterns would emerge. As the world we live in becomes increasingly interconnected and interdependent, the need for a greater capacity to model, design and manage complex systems is making this area particularly relevant to the challenges we face in the 21st century. Systems thinking is a way of describing the world in a more holistic manner based upon the model of a system. But let's start from the beginning. We can understand the world as things, that is parts or components, and their relations, that is how they are connected or fit together. So take a car for example. It is made up of parts, car parts such as engine, wheels and so on. And these parts are put together or organized in a specific way so as to make them function as a vehicle of transport. Now we call a group of things that are not organized in this way a set. So we'd call a group of cups on a table a set of cups because unlike the parts to our car, they have not been designed to serve some collective function. Because the group of cups is simply the sum of its parts, we would describe them by describing the individual properties of each cup and this would tell us everything we need to know about them. This approach to describing things is called analysis or reductionism. Reductionism is the traditional approach taken within modern science that tries to describe complex phenomena in terms of their individual parts. Now take the human body that is highly organized through a complex set of relations between its parts. Out of the arrangement of these parts in a specific way we get the overall functioning of the living organism. Because the parts are so strongly defined by their connections and function within the body as an entirety, to properly describe the parts we need to first understand the functioning of the whole body. This approach to describing things, that is that we can best describe things by understanding their place within the functioning of the whole they are a part of, is called synthesis and synthesis is the foundations of systems thinking. Thus we have two different approaches to describing things. On the one hand analysis that is interested in describing the individual components and synthesis that talks about the relationship between these components and their functioning as a whole. Ok, so now that we know a bit about systems thinking, let's put our newfound knowledge to use. Say a car manufacturing company has employed us to design their next great model. Now we could take two different approaches to this problem, applying analytical thinking or our friend's systems thinking. If we approach the problem from a traditional perspective, we would start by analyzing the car and looking for ways to optimize it. We might come away with a design that minimizes the car's drag by reducing its height by a few centimeters to increase its fuel efficiency. Now if we applied systems thinking to this problem, we would start by identifying the car's function, that is personal transportation, and the system it is a part of, the transportation system. From this perspective, we might not even need to design a new car at all, but end up designing some service that connects pre-existing resources to provide the same desired functionality. From this example, we can see how systems thinking is often employed when the current paradigm or way of doing things has reached its limit and gives us a fresh perspective on things. Systems thinking is the beginning of another closely related area called systems theory that goes on to give us a whole suite of tools for analyzing and modeling systems and their interaction dynamics as they evolve over time. So we can wrap up by saying that systems thinking is an emerging paradigm within many areas from science to engineering and business management that presents an alternative to our traditional modern analytical methods of inquiry by emphasizing the need for a more holistic and contextualized understanding of the world. Systems theory is a set of theoretical concepts used to describe a wide variety of things in terms of a model called a system. To give it context, let's talk a bit about its origins. Of course, people have been coming up with abstract theories about how the world works for a long time. Some ancient Greeks thought that everything was made of earth, water, fire and air, whilst others came to the conclusion that it was the expression of perfect geometric forms. 
Over the years, our theoretical systems have grown into large and sophisticated bodies of knowledge such as philosophy, mathematics, and many other areas of theoretical science. Although these theoretical frameworks are often limited to relatively specific areas of interest, during the 20th century, systems theory emerged as a new theory that draws upon many core concepts within these pre-existing methods to develop a more abstract framework that is designed to be universally applicable to all domains. In order to achieve such general relevance, systems theory starts with the abstract concept of a system and then applies this to modeling various different phenomena from biological to social and technical systems. The model of a system can be loosely defined as a set of parts, often called elements, that form a whole which is referred to as the system. A system exists within an environment and has a boundary that differentiates the system's exterior from its interior. An example of this might be a country, interior to which are all the people, institutions and other elements that constitute the nation as an entire system, whilst the exterior to its boundary is the international political environment. A system can be either open or isolated. Isolated systems do not interact with their environment, but most systems are open, meaning that there is an exchange of energy and resources between the system and its environment. The passing of energy or resources from the exterior of the system's boundary to the interior is termed an input, whilst the reverse is termed an output. Systems develop or function through the input of energy or resources from their environment. They process this energy by transforming it to create an output. If this output is of some value to its environment, it can be termed energy. If on the other hand, it is of negative value, it may be termed entropy, a scientific term for lack of order, disarrangement, or in more familiar terms, we might call it waste. An early use of this type of model was during the development of the steam engine, where scientists and engineers were thinking about the amount of fuel inputted to the engine relative to the power output and heat energy wasted. By using this model, they could create a quantifiable ratio between them that we would now term the efficiency of the system. Of course, this same reasoning can be applied to a wide variety of phenomena, from the processing of energy within a plant cell to the efficiency of a business organization. We can also model systems on various scales, thus elements can form part of systems that themselves form part of larger systems and so on. This is termed nesting or encapsulation and helps us to analyze the system on various levels whilst hiding away the underlying complexity. Systems theory explores many other areas such as emergence that raises key questions about the relationship between the parts within a system and the whole. That is, how elements can function together or self-organize to create some new and emergent structure as an entirety. Or other areas such as cybernetics, that deals with the system's control mechanisms that allow it to adapt and respond to changes within its environment through positive and negative feedback loops. Systems theory has found application within a wide variety of areas, forming the foundation for many new subjects such as system psychology, systems engineering, and systems ecology, to name but a few, all of which place an emphasis upon a more holistic and contextualized approach to understanding the world around us. Have you ever wondered why, when we look around us in the natural world, we see very few straight lines. But the straight line is ubiquitous in the systems we engineer. From buildings to circuit boards, it appears to be the default position. One way to understand this is that the systems we engineer are based upon our scientific and mathematical understanding of the world, which has inevitably started by describing the simplest and most orderly systems, that is to say, those that are composed of linear forms and relations. From Euclid to Newton and on, science has been focused upon the orderly systems of perfect squares, triangles and linear relations of cause and effect that can be encoded in beautifully compact equations. Thus we describe the real world as a kind of approximation to these perfect linear forms. But let's take a look at some of the basic principles underlining the theory of linear systems. Linear is basically a fancy word for line, and a line is often understood as the shortest or most direct path from one point to another. To say there is a linear relationship between two things is to say that there is a direct relationship of cause and effect between them. 
Let's take an example of this. Say I'm playing baseball and I hit a ball with a bat. If we make a model of this system, we see that the energy inputted by my swinging of the bat will be directly proportional to the output of the ball's momentum as it travels off in the opposite direction. This is a simplified model, but it illustrates the direct or linear relationship between cause and effect, my swinging of the bat and the ball's motion in response. There are of course many examples of linear systems, particularly within physics but we can capture the underlying logic of linear systems in general with a model that has only two simple rules called the superposition principles which states firstly that the output to the system will always be directly proportional to the input so if there is a linear relationship between the amount of fuel I put in my car and how far it will go well then if I put twice as much fuel in the car it will go twice as far and secondly that if we add two or more systems together then the output to this combined system will simply be the sum of the two outputs of the original systems. So say we have two tractor factories, each producing a million tractors a year. Well if we merge them, then we will get a factory that will produce two million tractors a year. Linear systems are deterministic, meaning that if we know their present state, we can fully determine their past and future states. This can be seen by plotting a linear system as a graph where it will always be depicted as a straight line. Although linear systems modeling has proven highly successful in many areas and is often a very good approximation, the reality is that we live in a world with ecosystems, economies, societies and physical systems that are not governed by the superposition principles and thus are what we call non-linear. An example of non-linearity might be listening to two of your favorite pieces of music at the same time. Because there is a relationship of interference between them, the result of the experience will not be a simple equation of adding the enjoyment from listening to each independently. This illustrates how non-linearity arises whenever there is some relationship between elements within the system that can be either synergistic, making the output of the system greater than the sum of its parts, or one of interference, making the output less than the sum of its individual components. To illustrate this further, let's take an example of four workers producing clothing. In isolation, each seamstress can sew a given amount of clothes within a day. Now if we put them together, we might get one of three results. Firstly, they might not interact with each other very much, meaning the whole would simply be the sum of its individual parts. But equally likely, they might form some cooperative relationship which lets them each specialize in a particular function, making them more efficient as a whole, and thus the output of the system will be greater than the sum of its parts due to these synergistic relations. Or inversely, they might start all talking with each other, getting little work done, and thus the total output would be less than the sum of the individual outputs due to these relations of interference. Nonlinearity can also arise from feedback loops, whereby the same process is iterated with the output fed back as the input to the next cycle. A classical example of this is compound interest, where at the end of each period, the balance plus interest is fed back into the formula to compute the next cycle of interest accumulation. Iterative functions are an important concept within nonlinear science and have been used to create a whole new type of geometry called fractal geometry whereby iterating a simple function generates irregular, organic-looking patterns that can model many of the geometric forms we see in nature, from the structure of seashells to the rugged formation of mountains. In these nonlinear systems, superposition fails, meaning one cannot break the system down into smaller subproblems and then add their solutions. We must consider a nonlinear problem in total. It is this need to approach nonlinear systems as a whole that is giving rise to new, more holistic approaches to science that are developing under the canopy of the term complex system science. Nonlinearity, in all its shapes and forms, is at the heart of many of the 21st century challenges to science as we try to extend the scientific framework beyond its dependency upon linear systems theory to finding new ways to embrace the complex world we live in on its own irregular and imperfect terms. Network theory is a way of describing the world in terms of a model called a network that allows us to capture the information about the relationships between things. But let's first think about why we might be interested in this at all. 
We often describe the world in terms of objects or things and their properties. We talk about a country and its GDP, people and their age, or the color of a car. This type of component-based analysis works well when the system we're interested in is relatively isolated. But when we turn up the interactions and connectivity between elements within a system, it is increasingly the connections that come to shape the elements and define the system as a whole. And thus we need a model that captures this information about the relationships and allows us to reason about it. This is where network theory comes in. Network theory starts with a very simple view of the world, as made up of nodes, which are things or objects, like people, cities, computers, etc. And the relationship between these things called edges, such as friendships, trading partners, cables, and so on. This abstract representation of the world can be used to model a wide variety of things. Thus, we can have social networks, biological networks, or logistics networks composed of interacting suppliers and consumers. Network theory gives us a set of tools for analyzing the individual elements and relations within these networks, the structure of the network, and the properties that these different network structures give rise to. The first set of questions we might like to ask about a particular network relates to its degree of connectivity, that is how connected an individual element or the whole network is. This will tell us many things about it, such as how quickly a new event could spread or propagate through the system. The average degree of connectivity will give us a quick answer to this. This is calculated by taking the total number of edges and dividing it by the total number of nodes within the network. We also need to take into account how large the network is, that is to say how far it is on average from one point to another. This is called the average path length and we can calculate it by taking the average of all the path lengths between all the nodes. Because networks are all about connectivity, we often ascribe value to individual nodes based on their degree of connectivity. There are various methods for calculating this, but a popular one called eigenvector centrality measures both how many edges a node has and how connected the nodes it connects to are. Popular web search engines use variants of the eigenvector centrality measure to rank web pages by calculating both the number of links into a web page and the total degree of connectivity of the pages that link into them thus gaining an idea of the relative importance of a website. Next, we're interested in talking about the overall structure of a network. This will be largely determined by how the relations between the nodes was formed. If the relations between the elements was generated randomly, we would expect a relatively even distribution of edges across the network. This type of structure, or topology, is called a distributed network, as the relative importance of any node is distributed across the entire network. A second type of network structure we can get is called decentralized or small world. This is generated by having local clusters of connections, but also having some random distant connections. An example of this might be a group of friends, with some of the friends having distant relatives in other parts of the world. By using these local connections within the group and distant connections, research has shown that it's possible to connect two random people within an average of just six steps, and thus it is termed small world. Lastly, we have more centralized networks called scale-free networks. This is where many nodes have chosen to connect to the same node, giving a degree of connectivity that greatly exceeds the average, whilst leaving many with a very low level of connectivity. Many real-world networks are thought to be scale-free, including social, biological, and technological systems such as the World Wide Web, where very few websites like Wikipedia have a very large amount of links into them, whilst the vast majority of websites have very few. These various types of network structures give rise to different properties. A key question we're interested in asking here is how robust or fragile is a particular type of network, as this will not only help us understand networks better, but it will also be of great significance in how we design and manage them. For example, think about a country with many small to medium-sized cities supplying the population with various public services. If we were to remove one of the cities, it would have a limited effect on the overall system because the network has a distributed structure, making it robust to failure of this kind. In contrary, if we take a country with one dominant capital city with the rest of the urban network dependent upon it for core services, this centralized network may be more efficient, but it is also in what is called a more critical stage, as affecting this single primary node would have a large systemic effect. As we transit from an industrial to information societies, 
Networks are emerging as a new paradigm in how we structure our systems of organization, both social and technological. Network theory is a young and rapidly growing area that provides us with a set of tools for designing and managing these new types of organization, and more generally understanding the world around us from a different perspective. Complex adaptive systems are systems composed of multiple diverse elements that are capable of adaptation and thus can evolve over time to exhibit highly complex behavior. But let's start from the beginning by talking a bit about adaptation. Adaptation is a process or capability through which systems can change in response to some event within their environment. In order for this to happen, there needs to be some control or regulatory mechanism within the system. Cybernetics is the area that deals with the system's regulatory mechanisms through what are called feedback loops, whereby the actions of a system generate some change in its environment and that change in turn feeds back to affect the system itself. A classical example given of this is a thermostat that regulates the temperature of a house. The system consists of a central controller where the desired temperature is set, a heater that creates an action that changes the state of the environment and a sensor to feed back the information about the environment to the controller. Wherever we have this basic degree of interaction and interdependence between elements, we can use the model of an adaptive system and feedback loops to describe its dynamics and thus we can model economies, society and ecosystems in this way. The different ways in which the interactions between a system and its environment affect each other generate different types of feedback loops. Primary among these are what are called positive and negative feedback. Firstly, positive feedback is an action that produces more of the same. For example, as global temperatures rise, Arctic sea ice melts. As this reflective sea ice disappears, the now exposed dark ocean waters absorb more heat, which in turn increases global temperature, and so on. In contrast, negative feedback produces less of the same action. For example, the more the price of apples goes up, the less the demand for apples from consumers, which in turn feeds back to reduce the price of apples again. These different feedback patterns in turn give rise to different systems' properties. For example, negative feedback is a form of self-regulation that typically generates very stable systems, whereas positive feedback loops often have destabilizing effects. An example of how this works may be seen in a grounded flock of birds, any of which is likely to fly away when it sees a neighboring bird fly off. Every time another bird reacts and takes flight, it increases the likelihood of more birds flying away. Thus, the system can be said to be unstable due to these positive feedback loops that allow for small events to propagate through the system. This same dynamic can be seen in many other domains such as financial systems where a loss of confidence can cascade through the system generating a bank run. We've been talking about adaptation and feedback loops but to get to complex adaptive systems requires multiple adaptive elements interacting. From these micro level interactions Adaptive systems can self-organize, allowing for the emergence of some macro-level pattern. An example of this might be the formation of a culture, where individuals in close proximity develop standardized methods for interaction and coordination through a common set of greetings, language and rituals. Over time, these micro-interactions will develop into a formal cultural system. These emergent, self-organized macro-structures whether they are markets, social institutions or cities, then in turn feed back to affect the actions of the individuals within the system, both constraining and enabling their future actions. Given this emergence of new levels of order as the system evolves, the element's capacity for adaptation and the complex interactions within the system, it is almost impossible to predict the future state of a complex adaptive system with any accuracy. The only viable method for modeling how these systems evolve over time is to simply let them develop and see what happens. Fortunately, we have computers that can simulate this process. This method of simulation is called agent-based modeling, where an element is given a simple set of rules that govern its behavior and left to interact to see what macro-scale patterns emerge over time. This method has shown that even with very simple rules governing the agent's behavior, complex and unpredictable phenomena can arise. 
Complex adaptive systems and its friend cybernetics are more than just the study of how birds flock or thermostats work. They are a whole new paradigm with which to understand and model the complex set of interconnected feedback loops that make up the natural, social and technological world we live in. If a system such as a plant, a building or a car shows organization, we tend to assume that someone or something must have designed it in that particular order. Self-organization is the idea that this type of global coordination can instead be the product of local interactions. The theory of self-organization has grown out of many different areas from computer science to ecology and economics. Out of these areas have emerged a core set of concepts that are designed to be applicable to all self-organizing systems from galaxies to living cells. But let's start by talking a bit about organization itself. Organization is a highly abstract concept, but we can loosely equate it to the idea of order, with its opposite being what is called entropy or disorder. Order and entropy are typically measured by scientists in terms of information. That is, the more information it takes to describe something, the more disordered the system is said to be. An example of this might be a piece of metallic substance, consisting of tiny magnets called spins. Each spin has a particular magnetic orientation, and in general they are randomly directed and thus cancel each other out. This disorganized configuration is due to its heat energy causing the random movement of molecules within the material. When we cool the material down, the spins will spontaneously align themselves so that they all point in the same direction. To describe the state of the spins in this ordered system would involve far less information relative to its original state that required a unique value for each randomly directed spin. This process of magnetization is often cited as an example of self-organization. That is the spontaneous appearance of order or global coordination out of local level interactions. But let's take a closer look at how this happens. As we cooled the material down, there was some area that had by chance some spins pointing in the same direction. Their alignment generated an increased magnetic force that was exerted upon its neighbors, creating what is called an attractor state, attracting other spins to this particular configuration. Each time another spin aligned itself with this particular attractor state, it augmented the force it exerted upon other spins through what is called a positive feedback loop that would cascade through the system until all elements were aligned within this new regime. Another example of self-organization through positive feedback is what is called the network effect, where the more people that use a product or service, the greater its value becomes. The telephone and Facebook are such examples, becoming more useful as more users join. In this way, local connections between individuals can rapidly form into global patterns. The network effect illustrates the positive relations or synergies between elements that can be created when they coordinate. It is due to the presence of these synergistic relations that the system as an entirety can be said to be more than the sum of its parts through a process that is called emergence. Ant colonies are classical examples given of emergence. Ants, governed by very simple rules and only local interactions, can through their combined activities generate colonies that exhibit complex structures and behavior that far exceed the intelligence or capability of any individual ant, and thus it is said to have emergent properties. Ant colonies also illustrate the decentralized structure to self-organizing systems. The queen does not tell the other ants what to do. Instead, each ant reacts to stimuli in the form of chemical scent exchanged with other ants. In this way, organization is distributed over the whole system. All parts contribute evenly to the resulting arrangement. As opposed to centralized structures, such as most social organizations, that are often dependent upon a single coordinator, this decentralized structure that is inherent to self-organizing systems often gives them a resilience and robustness. Any element that is damaged can be simply replaced by any other. Whether the self-organizing system is a social institution, a technology, or ecosystem, for it to sustain itself over time, it must be able to withstand change and intervention from its environment, requiring the system to be both robust to perturbations and capable of adapting to change. The generation of noise and variation within the system is a classical mechanism for achieving this. Without diversity, a system can become rigid and develop into what is called a critical state. 
An example of self-organized criticality could be an economy whose many industries have developed a dependency upon petrochemical fuels. This lack of diversity in energy sources means a small disruption in the supply chain of petroleum from the system's environment could have large global consequences. Inversely, systems with a high degree of diversity between elements are often more robust as the variety between elements makes them more effective at absorbing change. Ecosystems are classical examples of this, generating a large variety of species that make it capable of surviving significant changes within its environment. Thus we can see how evolution is a core concept in understanding the dynamics of self-organizing systems, whereby attractor states and feedback loops generate the system and periodic perturbations from its environment work to select the most adapted or fittest elements. As information technology is enabling new forms of organization, people within many domains are faced with the practical challenges of how to design and manage self-organizing systems, such as computer networks and new forms of social collaboration, all of which are making self-organization theory particularly relevant to the challenges we face in the 21st century. Earth system science is the interdisciplinary study of Earth as a complex system composed of multiple physical and biological processes that interact within cycles or spheres to give rise to the overall state of Earth as an entire system. Of course, people have been studying Earth for a long time. Geologists study the formation of rocks, meteorologists are interested in the atmosphere and so on. With all of these different domains, supported by the deep understanding of our physical environment that physics has built up over the past few centuries. But it is only more recently that satellites have started to allow us to see Earth as an entirety, and human activity has begun to have a significant enough effect to alter Earth's systems, making it increasingly important for us to be able to model and manage them. From space, we can view the net result of Earth's complex interactions, and with high-tech sensors on land and in oceans, we're getting a clearer idea of its overall makeup. From this, researchers in different domains are discovering how their pieces of the puzzle are related to one another. Earth System Science tries to develop models that give an integrated picture of how all these parts fit together. The first of these models is of Earth as a system in space for the inputs and outputs of energy or radiation from the Sun. With this energy being a primary factor in driving the dynamic processes within the system. As opposed to focusing on the static properties of Earth's individual components, Earth system science instead takes a more dynamic view of the world, studying the way energy and materials cycle through the different subsystems or what are called spheres. Earth's different spheres are largely defined by the different phases of matter they are composed of. Thus, the atmosphere is composed of gases, the hydrosphere of liquid water, and the lithosphere of solid materials. Added to this is the biosphere, which is the sum total of all biological material and processes. Within each sphere, a process called a cycle takes place. For example, in the lithosphere, we have the rock cycle, driven by the thermal energy within Earth's interior that releases minerals through ocean ridges and volcanoes that are weathered as they cycle through the Earth's crust and are eventually subducted, returning to their origin. The hydrocycle, driven by the thermal energy of the Sun, cycles water between the Earth's surface and atmosphere through the process of evaporation, condensation and precipitation. This process helps to distribute moisture to support ecosystems at a variety of locations. The atmosphere is a layer of gases surrounding the planet that is held in place by gravity it is the primary vehicle of temperature and climate regulation through the cycle of carbon in and out of the atmosphere where it functions through the greenhouse effect to trap the sun's heat. The biosphere is the relatively thin layer of Earth's surface that supports all biological activity. The biosphere is a system also characterized by the continuous cycle of material and energy in the form of the flow of solar energy and nutrient mineral cycles. Solar energy flows through the biosphere along a unidirectional path. As the sun's energy is inputted through plant photosynthesis and processed up through what are called trophic levels, from primary producers to herbivores and on to predators and apex predators. Alongside the flow of energy through food webs is the cycle of mineral nutrients, the core substances required for the construction of biological material and processes. Carbon, water, oxygen and nitrogen 
have been continuously cycled through the biosphere from one generation to the next for billions of years. These different spheres interact to create a unique state or ecosystem. An ecosystem is the combination of a community of biological organisms and a particular physical environment with which they interact. Thus we can understand an ecosystem as a certain combination or mix of our different spheres and the climate. For an ecosystem to develop over time requires a relatively stable balance between its constituent elements. This balance is typically regulated through what are called feedback loops. Earth system scientists are beginning to understand Earth's regulatory mechanism as a complex of feedback loops. These feedback loops can be either positive or negative. Positive feedback loops typically have a destabilizing effect and can lead to very rapid change. Inversely, negative feedback loops typically have a stabilizing effect on Earth systems. Planet Earth is one of the true complex systems with multiple diverse elements on multiple scales that are highly interconnected, interacting and adapting as they co-evolve over time. Developing the models and amassing the data to get a coherent picture of the functioning of Earth systems is one of the core challenges to contemporary science.